You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. With Millwall, it was um, so secretive. That's why I've just come on after all these years. But because of my near death experience, I've got to get I've got to get the proper I've got to get the stories out. One of them uh, put a glass in one guy's face. One done one with a bottle. And it was all blood running down the terraces. I'm nearly 65. I've been done many times at football. There's no shame in that because the amount of rounds you're going to be in, you, you're going to get done. You're going to get done. It's just what they call the law of averages. So there was 12 of us. We run 120. We run and they dropped their weapons and the bird man threw, he threw a petrol bomb that went 64 up in the air. And as they was all trying to get away, they dropped their weapons, James. And there was a big um, pile of them all falling out and we just give them a, a terrible beating. So, we always thrown a hand grenade on the pitch at Brentford. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Mo Wall's top boy, Ginger Bob. Bob, how are you? Oh, all right, James. Good to see well, you. Good to see you too. Had a few of the football hooligans on. Yeah. Mad stories, no doubt you would have came face to face over yeah. the years. But Mo Wall is always the top boys. They're, as as far as I know, they they were always the one at the forefront. Even to now, that people just say they keep churning out mad men. That always a top firm. Biggest in Britain as as far as I'm concerned. I know mm. a lot of people might disagree, but mm. even the football casuals I've had on, they've always said Mo Wall's always mm. up there. First and foremost, how are you? Not too well. Well, I've been ill, but I've come through it, mm -hmm. and um, I'm here. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too. Before we get into all the madness, I always go back to the start of my guests. Where you grew up, how it all began. Yeah, right. I was born in a place called the Elephant Castle um, on the 29th of March, 1958, um, and I was I was brought up in Peckham, uh, just stones throw away from Millwall. How was your How was your upbringing as a kid like? Parents around, good schooling, um, or did it start off crazy? I had very, very good parents, um, but it was always, I had a rebellious side to me, so I was always, um, I don't know if it was because when I first went to school at five and then junior school, secondary school, I was always bullied. Being a ginger boy with like freckles, I was bullied, so I had to stick up for myself and I got in I got in a terrible lot lots of fights. Um when I was eight, I had a fight in front of the whole of the school with the um the, the bully of the uh, of the school, he was eleven, and um I gave him a good beating as an eight year old. Did this boy was a foot and a half bigger than me and from a young age I knew I could fight. I was always good with my hands and after I went home, the, the the bully who I beat up, his parents came round my mother and father's house and um, was uh, complaining about an eight year old boy beat eleven year old boy up. But that's very sad. But but I've, I used to have a lot of trouble from a young age. A lot of is that where the violence kind of came from then? Try to defend yourself a lot. Well, where I grew up in Peckham in the sixties, they used to bully the white kids. Used to bully the black guys and the Asian guys, if they weren't around, then it was the, because I was different, ginger boy, they'd, they'd pick on me. So I couldn't get any peace. I was always un, under pressure. So that sort of, um, that brought the worst out in me. And that would be going to football. I was going to football from a four-year-old at Millwall and I joined the gang, we call it Firm, uh, uh, as an 11. I was a boy skinhead at 11 and I joined the gang then. What was your first proper terror? What form? Well, what age? Um, four, five, as an 11 year old, um, there was tear up. What happened? I was standing on the halfway line and I was still with my father then and 50 big guys came in early, uh, Bristol City, leather jackets. And, um, and I went up to them, I said, Fellas, don't stand there. Go up, go go up to the away because the boys have been in a minute. And they turn around and said, "Fuck off, you little butt, little wanker!" Like, and I said, "Fair enough." And then the guy who founded Millwall, 
in 64-65 season is a continuation from the mods, a guy called um, Dave Ran. They called him the captain because he had a beard, feather cut. He came in with, um, he was in his, he would have been in his mid-20s and you had all the 18, 19 year olds, all these youngsters. This is the early days. And they came in and it was like, um, it was like a film, like, you know, Russell Crowe, the uh, gladiator. Right, yeah. But he came in and he, a couple of hundred of guys, and he just pointed like that. And then two of the younger guys, uh, well-known guys, I won't name their names, they're still alive now. And uh, one of them uh, put a glass in one guy's face, one done one with a bottle, and there was all blood running down the terraces. But I did tell the guys, don't stand there, because you're, you're going to get yourself in trouble. But um, when you're a little kid, no one's going to respect you. They, can, they just think, oh, a mouthy little kid. So um, I wasn't involved in the fight, but I was, and I was there. But um, the, pro most, the first proper fight was involved with was West Ham as well. That was when we were playing Orient. And what happened, I was on the train. I was 13. I was with my father. And what happened, West Ham's Mile End Firm was at Wapping. And what happened, they broke into, um, um, they got all these pickaxe handles and stuff. They broke into uh, the stuff at the station and got all these iron bars. And what happened, we was all packed on the train. And they, the first couple of guys who came out, they started beating them. But once we got out and we got like on the platform with them, there was like um, a massive fight. But we, we pushed them back and we got the better of them. But that was the first one that I was really involved with. I was 13. Is that when you realise this is what you wanted to do? It's it's like a disease, you, 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 the adrenaline rush, and it's very, very hard to get out of, once sure. Yeah, so a lot of people who don't understand it, who's never done it, will never understand why people do it. Like, was it such a buzz for you? Did it make you feel alive, especially if you're being bullied at school, to then feeling part of something? Is that what keeps it? Kind of fire going well, what, for that. It was like at Millwall. If you if you get Millwall, Tottenham, Arsenal, Chelsea, and West Ham, it's like the five families in New York, like the mafia. Mm -hmm. And but with Millwall, it was um, so secretive. That's why I've just come on after all these years. But because of my near death experience, I've got to get I've got to get the proper I've got to get the stories out. But I've got a photographic memory and. I can remember stuff in the 60s and 70s and 80s like it was yesterday. Um, with Millwall, it's, um, how can I put it? It's very, um, we're very tight. We're very tight. Um, before I, I got to the top of the firm as a young age at 17, when I was 15, I had my own little firm as well, like a sub firm with all people from the age of 15 to 17. And I will give you two instances of what, um, what happened at 15. We played Aston Villa, the match had finished. And you, when you're young, you think you're invincible. And I, I happened to have my father, uh, my best trousers on and I'd still toe cap brogues. So I went down to the, um, after Aston Villa, down at what they call New Cross Great Station, on my own. The police were there and they thought it quite amusing. They, they let a German shepherd and the German shepherd grabbed hold of my uh, right buttock and it sunk its teeth in, ripped my trousers. So I knew when I get home, I'm going to get a beating from my dad. So what happened? I swung, the dog got swung, I swung the, donk, uh, the dog off and what I did, um, not that I'm, because um, I love animals, but because of the situation, you just, what I did, I kicked the dog in the face and a couple of its teeth come out. So the police chased me up, up the platform and a mile down the road, but I got away. That was April 73, um, I was just 15. And then um, we played a match with Nottingham Forest and we only took like a hundred firm up there and the, um, most of them got thrown in the trent. I, I was lucky that day, I didn't get beat, but we, we was under pressure. So we played them on a Tuesday in a League Cup match. We lost the League match 3-0, but we beat them in the League Cup. I was at what they call the back of the halfway line, and a little kid come up, he said, Bob, Bob, they're here, they're up the... Uh, 
what happened, there was 40 Romany gypsy guys from Newark, forest boys, all in their 30s and 40s, and they all had weapons. So we've gone down there 25 handed, and one of my mates, he had um, a crash, and we, we, we didn't have any tools with us. So we've gone straight into them, and this guy went, went to put um, an axe in um, my head, and one of my friends is here from Islington, um, uh, Talian Tony, he blocked the guy's eye, blocked the guy's arm. So what happened? Um, we was all rolling about on the floor and fighting. And what happened? This sergeant he, he um, arrested me. Who was the um, big tall guy? And he took me by behind the sand and gave me a beat. And in them days, the way we used to talk, I said, "Leave it out, governor." Then got I nearly got killed. Nearly got my head chopped off. They were all told up. He said, "You're just trying to get out of a nick." So he said, "But if you're telling the truth, I'll, I'll let you go." So we went round at Millwall. You had a hooli van where they used to take the people, and then they used to take them if they were nicked. They'd take them to the nick. There was all these weapons on the table. Oh, you were telling the truth, he said. So he kicked me up in the arse and he said, oh, don't come back in. But I still went back in. But that, that was when I was 15. How, does, how did Millwall get the fearsome reputation that it's got? When did that start? It started from the early days because we always, at the, at, at the top table, we always had, to, we, we had more heavy guys than the other, the other firms. And... Um, we used to be outnumbered most of the time. Because we were so strict, if anybody ran, they, they would be completely ostracised from the firm. Out on the firm, we, we just didn't. So you don't, even if you're going to get killed, you have to stand your ground and fight. Does it then nobody, nobody runs? Nobody runs. What happens if somebody runs, Bob? Well, if you run, you, you're, 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 uh, you're not just told, you're, 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 you'll get physically dealt with. And you're told from a young age, this is something you don't... It's like being in the mafia and, and being a in, uh, grass or informer or, or taking money off of, um, take, taking money off of um, people high up the food chain. You have to work to parameters. And when did you start moving through the ranks? I started moving through the ranks 15, 16, and I got to the top at the, the 1975 um, testimonial between Mill and West Ham when um, one of your friends who you've interviewed many times, um, I, I put it, I, I, what happened? We let West Ham come in the ground. We was on the halfway line. Because there was all fences, we, we had to climb the, I was the first one round there. 17, I met my ginger hair. I had my army, my dad's army second world war because he, he was American, well, was in the American army. Granddad was American. I had this American jacket on and yellow roll neck pullover and I went there and one of your friends I won't name his name because it's not the way we do things and um, you know what I'm talking about and he went mill shit and spat on the floor so I hit him on the he went down out the ground I thought it was going to get nicked I wasn't so then I came back in just after half time and what had happened there was West Ham in the cold blow um maybe a thousand and a thousand mil were all round them and two lines of police. So I've come in from behind. They recognised I was there earlier. So two guys went, was trying to plunge me. I'm on my hands and knees. I was like crawling through um, policeman's legs and I turn around and I'm 17 and all, all the top boys are mill all there in their 20s, 30s and 40s. And I said, we're going to let them do this. Or we, what are we going to do? I said, nah. And what happened? We, we attacked. The police went down like chocolate soldiers, and then it was toe to toe fighting. And then, as people were getting done, all the bodies were piling up. We pushed them down the stairs, but it was a very, very, uh, very violent. I, I whacked a few people who um, who you know, but I won't, I won't know their names. Who won? That we one. won. We won. All the teams that are in London, like why is it Mowell and West Ham? The hatred is so powerful. It started from the Dockers. Um, there was a strike in 1900. Um, one, because Millwall is 1885 from the Isle of Dogs. West Ham is from Stratford Marshes, 1895. We're the older team by 10, uh, ten years. Um, that's why the Cray supported Millwall, because of their uh, granddad, Cannonball Lee. And that's why um, the Richardsons, because you've still got the older generation, you've got a lot of Millwall that come from East London, like Stepney and Isle of Dogs. But one side went, one side broke the strike. I think we did. I think Millwall was wrong. I think Millwall went back to work and West Ham stayed on strike. But 
hatred. It used to go off um, before the war and after the war. But um, it's, it's, it's just a terrible... Um, when you've got a football match and they have to put two helicopters out. What's the toughest firm you've came up against? You might... You, you've interviewed one of, one of their top guys and I, I know a lot of their top guys because I've done... I've, I've done a chapter in their book for them and um, he, he, I've got to give it to uh, Cardiff. Yeah? Yeah. Because 99, um, 300, 300 mil wall to 400 mil wall, got on the pitch at the end of the game, went down underneath. I, I'd left the ground because the police were going to arrest me. They left the, I left the ground with my brother and a guy called Big Frank who's just passed away, Big Frank Duffy, one of our boys. Mm -hmm. He's three... Um, we we left and people can't understand how I got back to the station unscathed, but we, we did. But I picked them up at um, uh, on the way back at uh, Swindon. You know the, the Paddington to, yeah. to Bristol Cardiff line, and everyone's all the mills sitting on the train, cuts and bruises and bandages. But what happened? Three or four hundred. Um, that was Cardiff's biggest turnout. They had three or four thousand firm. But Millwall fought. They had nowhere to run. They, they got the worst of it. Um, some of my mates thought they were going to die. Um, very, very bad. But before that, we had a massive... Um, there's a guy called Di. I won't say what... He, they call him Di the Taxi. I won't say what his second name is. But he he's Cardiff. He's a year younger than me. And he said the best row he's ever seen at football was... Um, the 28th of March, 1976, when we played, and we had 300 firm, they had 2,000. And they had all these black girls and mixed race girls with pop socks on, used to have in the 70s, and they had all the steel combs and the knives. And some of our people were getting stabbed, and I said to the old Bill, look, what are you going to do? And then they, they picked them up, tipped them up, and all the, all the steel combs and knives fell down. But what happened, one of my, um, sorry, one of my friends, um, he got captured by Cardiff and they was beating him to death. And I had hush puppies on, which is it's silly to wear hush puppies. I've gone back in the crowd in, into Cardiff's firm because we were 300 in the block and they was like surrounding either side and they'd, they'd like um, 2,000 firm. So I've gone back and pulled him, pulled him along the floor. People have attacked me, but because of the adrenaline, I managed to block them. And about 10 guys come back to help me, pulled him back, saved his life in the firm. Now, when we got back to the station, Cardiff's firm and the police were all laughing. Uh, they, went, they went to walk back to the town centre. And what happened, a train came in and we were told to get on this empty train straight back to London. Only 50 got on the train. There was still 200. I'll give a council of war. I spoke to them. I'll give a council of war. I said, let them get, we're going we're to kick them gates out and come back. We kicked the gates in, 250s, come out and we run right, smashed all the pubs up and, any, and the police had to come back in force. Anyone we see hanging about, we, but that, this guy died who, who was on their side, he said it's the, the best he's ever seen and he's been up and down the country for years. That was the 28th of March, 76. I was a day before me, um, day before me 18th birthday, but things, it, it was just like the Wild West. How was it? planning then in the 70s and 80s like with no phones and was well, it just a case of walking around to find well my mate who who was who started the firm in 64 65 the guy with the beard we called the captain after blackbeard the pirate we told him stick tight because we're going to be outnumbered there was a bit of trouble in the park on the right and i said don't break ranks but he didn't listen he went into the bluebird club cardiff where there were 400 of their boys and my mate Dave, he's so stubborn, he would never run or back down. No? He's, he's a cross between um, Dick Emery and Harry Enfield, Mr. Angry. But he had the feather cut, the beard, earring, um, Silver St. Christopher, still comb in his Ben Sherman, sharpened up. He had the dungarees, the black steel toe cap boots, um, and he used to give it, we called it the Bermondsey Bowl, you know, roll the shoulders. But he went in the club and he got a chair over his head, cut the chairs, <laughs> and he was still standing, wouldn't run. So they got backed up, backed off, him and this guy, John, who, the one, uh, they called him Winkle because uh, he 
he was a small guy, but three the three legged man, if you understand what I mean. But what happened um, when they came in the ground? We was in, in in like the paddock. There was a stand behind us, three hundred of us, and he had these bandages around my head, his head, and they was all taking a piss out and calling him Geronimo. But that was in the ground, and then what I've spoke about earlier was what happened with the fight afterwards and the, the knives in the pot stop, and then we kicked the gates down and come back out. But that day was full on. It was full on from when we got there in the ground. Um, their leader at the time, who's still alive, um, I won't say his surname, but he's Big Frank with the end of He looked like, um, you know the film The Long Good Friday? Yeah. You know Razors, mm -hmm. Cutting cut Razors? He looked like him. And um, he was he was behind us, and I was getting uh, I was going crazy in the ground. Get down there, uh, have a fight because the adrenaline and the passion. But um, that day was an absolute uh, what they call blockbuster. That day, who's nonstop. The who's the toughest man you've come up against? No, normally, uh, normally I've been fighting more than one person, and um, but when we when we played West Ham in 89 over there, we had 700 firm. We met at Surrey Docks. We got off at Plasto because we were told to by West Ham and the police tried to hold us, but we had 700 firm. We pushed the police. West Ham come out of Side Street, a pub at Side Street, and they was about 300 handed and they see how many numbers there. So what they would done, they went round the back street to negate the numbers. So it's, they sort of, um, their front people could get to the front and maybe push us back. But what happened? The police are there, so loads of police. And um, this guy, I'm, I'm going to talk about this guy because he's passed away. I'm talking about Peter. One of their top fighters or their best fighters was a guy called Demolition Chris, six foot six, boots, steel boots. He had a, like, um, um, you know, like, uh, Garage, you know, like a garage, uh, uh, what do they call it? Um, it what's that things they wear on with the... Um, Duffel coats? No, no, no. no. Um, you know, like a um, repair, car repair man. You know, with the... Um, oh, boiler suit, mechanic boy. Boiler suit. So the police said to me and him, we'll give you five minutes. So this man, he's 6'6", I'm about 6'1", so I thought, it's a bit like the OK Corral, who gets him first, or gunfight. Um, I've always had speed of hands because boxers I work with doing door work and security. They said for a big man, I don't. Your hand speed is unbelievable. But what happened? I I got my punch in first, a big one on his chin, put him down, knocked him out, one punch, and that was in front of all them people. And you can imagine how, how you feel after that. Well, he could have done me, I could have done him, but the fact is, I I, I just got him first and done him. So, um, on that particular game, because they was embarrassed, West Ham, we came back to South London to a place called Surrey Docks and we was in pub. We were waiting for them to come back. They were coming back. And they did come back. But what happened? They came back late, about nine o'clock. They came back 400-handed. We had 350. But what happened? People who don't live in South London anymore, because I was, I was up in Edmonton, so I've left. There was only 100 Millwall left. They were tooled up, but it was um, all the Bermondsey lot. West Ham came out, and, but Millwall attacked them straight away and run them everywhere. They run them back in the station. They run them back over uh, there's a place called Southwark Park, and they run them down the road. They broke ranks, West Ham, and a lot of them got hurt. But for 100 guys to do 400. But the problem we have with West Ham is that they don't admit when we get done we admit they never admitted it and there's people stuff that I'm saying now they, they think I'm talk, talking fairy tales but what happened um, I'll tell you this incident, incident which is very important West Ham are playing um, Crystal Palace at Selhurst Park now we're only playing whole city at home in the, in the third division we was in a pub called the Rose Inn. So I've gone in the pub, the 60 mil were in there. And there's all these cases on the floor with baseball bats and, 
And they said, um, Bob, they said, um, it's all going to go off in a minute. I said, what you He said, West Ham's coming out of New Cross Station. They're going to come up to us and we, we've got a big row. We were 60 handed. We stood in a the line. They come up the road. It was like Zulu, 350. We all pulled out uh, baseball bats. And as they got close, they were just smashing them with baseball bats. They run them down the road. And what happened, just before New Cross Gate Station, you got um, um, to the left, uh, there's a pub called the New Cross Inn. Just next to there, you got a Jamaican barber shop. So he said, what's all the commotion? What's going on? I said, oh, it's people from East London, West Ham, come over to South London to take liberties. So they all come out, pulled knives, and they was all getting involved as well, the Jamaican guys. We pushed them back to New Cross Station, and they was all... And then what happened, the police turned up, and Millwall run all down the side streets. But I, I, I stayed and was still punching people. I got arrested. Um, one of West Ham's black guys got done with a milk crate and he was like severely head, severe head injuries. I got arrested, put in what they call a Q car, which is like plain clothes police, nicked. I put on an act and said to the police, my brother's been stabbed. He's on the operating table at Greenwich Hospital. And... Um, I was convincing. They said, right, we're going to let you go. But if we see you, because there's going to be loads of more trouble, then you are nicked. So I, I had to come off the scene. But what happened, um, BG, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? He brought 100 at top, uh, West Ham's, because he's been embarrassing, and he's come back, and he's gone to a pub called The Crown and Anchor, and it's like 50 of Mills top boys, the older ones now. So it's all gone off again. And then West Ham's got done for a second time. Because of the embarrassment, what happened, um, another guy, CP, CP, you know that is, doesn't it? He had to go, to, he was going to court, so he was going to get a put away for football activities. And then we had a decommissioned post office van with all weapons in. So Millwall, this is the week after, this is like March um, 84. Now, because I missed the train with my brother to go from Queens Road, Peckham, to um, London Bridge, I missed all the action, or well, the start of the action. Now, what happened, there's 50 Millwall. It was like um, the younger ones and the 40 younger ones and 10 older ones. And what happened, West Ham was 120 handed. It was all their firm, the under fives and uh, the Birdman. You know the Birdman is, don't it? So what happened, they, they've all got tooled up. Me will see West Ham at the bottom of the hill at London Bridge Station, run down at them. And as West Ham's come around the corner, they went after some of this, pulled all the tools up and run Millwall back to the station. Now, what happened? 40 of the youngsters just run away and left 10 guys, older ones, with two young kids. So they stood behind this barrier where the swing doors were and they was giving them crates of pills bottles. They throw them, as West Ham trying to get through the doors, they were all getting hit on the head. The reason there was no... Um, there was no police there. There was a political demonstration going on at Waterloo Station. All the police were down there. So when I turned up, it's been going on for 10 or 15 minutes, this standoff. When I got up, there was all, I thought it was an IRA attack. You're talking about 84. Now there was women and children and ordinary people cowered against, against the wall, all like, and I looked and it was all like smoke and all shower glass flitting through the air. So I see a fight at the door, at the, outside the rail bar, the main door where the black taxis are, and I thought, which who's Millwall and who's West Ham? So I've looked and I see 10 Millwall. So I've turned around, I, I said to my brother, stand behind me. So I said to the older guys, I said, I'm going to have some of this. But I took my coat off and I give, them, I give West Ham a speech. I, give them, I, I said, you know me, Ginger Bob, you know, I wasn't here earlier, I'm, I'm here now. And, and I said, if you want it, I, I wasn't even told up. They were told up. I said to the guys, over you come, lads. So there was 12 of us. We run 120. We run and they dropped their weapons and the Birdman threw, he threw a petrol bomb that went 64 up in the air. And as they was all trying to get away, they dropped their weapons, James. And there was a big um, pile of them all falling out and we just give them a, a terrible beating. But... They, they think it never happened, but I was there at the front of it. Like they, they say that it's a, a figment of imagination, but it's not. When was the first time you got to jail, Bob? Went to jail? Yeah. Never been to jail, James. Never? 
what happened, um, I was at Crown Court four or five times mm -hmm. and um, brown bread, you know brown bread is, yeah. don't you? And um, Tiny, who's dead, Tiny, so I can say. And, and um, Charlie R. I, I'd got nicked, not for football, for villainy. And I was at Crown Court and they, they told me to go to a place called Wharf Road, a Jewish firm, Goldcorns. And they stopped me going away. Um, I won, for, in the 70s and 80s, I, I won four Crown Court cases. Now, what happened, um, they tore the police. The police were there with their notebooks. The police were there with their notebooks and they destroyed them. And the police was going, oh, 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 like that. And not guilty, not guilty, not. But, but, for, but for the uh, the barristers from this firm, I would have been in, inside several mm -hmm. times, as you say, down the stairs. Um, the other time I got away with one was uh, Boxing Day, um, 1980 we played Portsmouth they had 2,000 Portsmouth in the corner in the way in the old ground and me and six guys went in a few went in early like my brother they got run on the pit and um, I'm whacking a load of people but the police had me banged to rights got nicked so I'm at court um, Campbell magistrates um, I'm just about to get six months and I changed my plea and what I changed my plea and um you, you never believe this because that was in January. I went back to court the 1st of May. Well, in the middle of April, there was a Brixton riots. I had six policemen who had me banged to rights. Every single of them coppers got done in the Brixton riots and they was in a hospital, King's College Hospital, Camberwell. So I had my little barrister with me and he and the police said, well, we want to put this up. All the witnesses are in hospital. I said, oh, Mr. Payne, oh, he's... Um, He's been all this inconvenient. So, you know, all the blah, blah, blah. So they said, let's do it now. So from six months, I got a £50 fine and bound over. That was that was lucky. Mm -hmm. What was it like? Um, what was Tiny like? Did you ever see the conversation between Bill Gardner and Tiny when Bill says yeah, he yeah, gave but, Tiny a call? But when we played him in 78, mm -hmm. when we played him in 78, um, I'll tell you what happened with Tiny and Bill after the match, but um, what happened, um, Marley, uh, we, we was going over there. Eight, it was 18th of November, 1970 out of 20. So a couple of our boys got nicked at New Cross, Sta New Cross Gate Station, getting on the tube, like fighting with the police. But we had 50 of our top people and West Ham's firm at the time, that Marlene's firm, they had 50 and they was they was in the, the back carriage. We was in the second of back carriage. So the train's going along towards Upton Park. So what happened, we went into their carriage and they was at the far end, 50, and we, we was 50, even numbers. So their top man of my end, who subsequently a little, I had a fight with that day, but what happened, he said, I can smell we all in here. So... One of my mates from Peckham, older guy, he said, what are we standing here for? Let's get on with it. Let's get it. And everyone went, have some of this. Pull tools out. They pulled tools out. It went mental. As someone wasn't killed. Now, we're all fighting at the back carriage. Now, what happened? We got the better of them, and they all got off at Bromley Barbeau because it's like an open station. You can go up the bank. So what happened? They went, but their top guy at Mile End, he, um, me and him shaped up. And he's a pro boxer. He used to be, he was like in between light heavyweight and crew, a bit lighter than me, but he was British champion and also um, Commonwealth. And Now, I just went into him. He didn't get a punch in. I smashed him to pieces, ripped his, um, ripped his T-shirt off, his chain, his, um, his Arrington jacket, and his face was all like that. And I was about to hit him on the head with a breeze box. That would have seriously... Um, one of the Millwall guys pulled me off him, pulled me off him. And then it nearly ran away. And he, he was at the ground with all, all these marks on him. But he's a guy that's gone on um, social media and said he's never been done a football. But he's, it's just nonsense, James. Do you see that a lot? People not admitting they've been run sometimes? Look, I'm standing here from, from 11-year-old 11, 11 boy sitting here, rather. I'm nearly 65. 
I've been done many times at football. There's no shame in that because the amount of rounds you're going to be in, you, you're going to get done. You're going to get done. It's just a, what they call the law of averages. That's what we don't like. They won't admit to us, us doing them. Mm -hmm. But I've never been, I've never been, I've never, I've, I've, I've been done by Chelsea, been done by Palace. I've, I've never been done by West Ham because I, I metamorphosized when I played West Ham. I fight about 10 times better because that is the shame of all shame to be done by them. What about, see when you're, what did you do for work, Bob, when you were, when you were doing the football scene? You were a bouncer there? Yeah. Did you I work the a, doors? I was a bouncer. Mm -hmm. I started off uh, working for a printing works, then I was apprentice electrician. Then I was in the post office for 20 years as a union official. Upset all them at the post office. Then, did was, they know what you were doing? Yeah. Yeah, but well, it was, yeah, I kept it pretty. But what happened, um, when I let, uh, I was doing it part-time, um, uh, bodyguarding, minding, uh, door work. But when when I left in 91, I got the tack, I got the sack, but I went to tribunal and won my case. So I got all my pension and all my money back. Um, then, then I went more into um, I went more into the uh, bouncing scene, minding, and all things like that. Who was that? It's, well, in two thousand, um, I went to a club, and um, you know the A team, I don't you? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the Riley's I used to work for, and. Um, Eight guys come in with a black guy and an Italian guy. And um, in the club, and um, two plain close coppers in there, they got done in the club. So I broke it up, got hit with. And um, this guy hit me, he's one of the nephews of the, hit me on the shoulder. I went, You little muggy, muggy cunt, I said to him. Black guy ran away, and the other people over there used to work for someone. They said, Bob, Bob, that's the A team, I didn't. But what happened? They went outside. The coppers, plain coast coppers, were outside. And one of the plain coast coppers got chiffed outside. So it's all blood on the floor. Cub got closed down. Geezer come up, who's serving for him, you know, serving for him, who's, um, what's his name, son. You know, uh, uh, McVitie, mm -hmm. Jack the Hat, the two guys, one of them's passed away, TL. Mm -hmm. it, it was his younger brother, CL. We know the ones with the goatee beard hat. I said, sorry, mate, mate it's going And he tried to push me away like a mum. I, I hit him, put him down on the floor and, and throttled him. He went back and said, oh, this bloke, blah, blah. So a contract was put out on me. But the next morning, people in the underworld from South London... They phoned him up and said, that bloke's like my son. What are you doing there? Oh, mistake, mistake. So they wanted me to meet, what's his name, of the, and work for him. But if you, it's like Tottenham and Arsenal. If, if you work for the other lot, you're not going to work for the, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But that, that forced me to come off the door. Yeah. And then I was cabbing. I was cabbing for um, lap dancers, um, pop promoters, um, DJs, you know, you take them from one club and you pick the. I was doing that for a while, but then in 2015, um, I got undercut by Uber, so I wasn't making enough money. So then I came back to security, I came back, um, eight years ago. What about so, see, when you're doing the, the football kind of scene, is that when was Mowall at its peak when it had two, three thousand, five thousand bodies behind it? Like, when was it at the peak, the 90s, 80s? L no, all through the seventies, mm -hmm. all through the eighties, and then like the early nineties. But even even into modern times, obviously, if we played West Ham or Tottenham or, or Liverpool or Man United, or especially Newcastle, we got a big thing with Newcastle. People come out the woodwork, thousands. Why Newcastle? And, and, Newcastle, I used to work up there from 1980 to um, back end of 85. And um, they've come down and we've gone there. But it's just a bit of history and a few people have got hurt on either side. Um, 
we was up I was up there in 91 with um a friend of mine called uh, we called him uh, Bald Eagle because he had a hair transplant he's a Newcastle guy but um he um Millwall's his other team but he's got he got more and more and he made his name when he was like 18 and he chased a load of Chelsea down Northumberland Street with a big axe um we was up there and we was at the ground. It was in St. James's Park and the police radios are cracking. He said, Mill's on the rampage. And I could hear, well, Mill's come out of the station, 28 guys. But what happened? Well, they were drinking beer. Someone's put all drugs and pill in their drinks. So they've all gone. They've come out, 250 Newcastle outside. Um, by what they call the, um, you know, look, it, there's, outside there's a, a wine lodge. They're called um, Wine Lodge, you know, the sawdust on the floor so they they've come down pink lane 250 andy mills just attacked them run them everywhere and what happened they went in a couple of pubs and you had pints of newcastle brown exhibition cigarettes in the ashtrays and that where they newcastle's just like right, mills on it's only 28 mil they're all off their rocker so a couple of Millwall, that's my mate who's passed away big frank they got a, a piano and pushed it down the hill out of one of the pubs and the police couldn't believe the police we never seen anything like it but when I went back to the station we was about there was that 28 plus a plus my mate Johnny Johnny Cheatham Bald Eagle and me and all their top boys were there and they and we was all shaping up to have a fight and the police were there and they said, come to Whitley Bay, come to Whitley Bay. They wanted the both to get on the train, have Whitley Bay and have a row. But obviously the police wouldn't, wouldn't allow it. So they pushed us on the train. But we was all shaping up. That was back in um, 91. So let's come back a long time as well, and yeah. we're talking about all the memories. Mm. What well, see, I had a guy on the undercover copper to try to do Chelsea, Millwall, mm. uh, Crystal Palace, but everything threw out. Did you ever come across him? What happened? I was, um, you know, earlier I said, like, the five families. Yeah. Well, at Millwall, we got all, as he's in to, there's been many top boys. Mm -hmm. But you've got different firms. Now, what happened, I was with the F Troop. I'm not F Troop. I've guested for them. I'm Millwall Halfway Line, who took over from, from the captain, the guy with the beard. That's, and the other guy who was going to come to those, he, he's from that. And Danny as well and his father and his grandfather his grandfather even knew me now what happened we was drinking in a place called Fat Larry's by the Michael Sobel Sports Centre of, uh, up at Finsbury Park early in the morning we all got 120 of us we come down Blackstock Road and what happened Arsenal appeared by the Arsenal Tavern run them everywhere a couple of mill got nicked and from the left another firm which is a Bermondsey Deptford firm, probably about 100, 150 of them, because we had all different firms out. They had um, smashed a pub up further up the road and they'd also uh, savage a load of Arsenal. But they were five minutes behind us. So as we got to the ground, most of them all got picked up by the police, put in the what they call the clock ends. There was... The gate that day was about 58, 59,000, but we had 14,000 there. We had the West Lower at Highbury and the Clock End. I was drunk. I had a big ginger beard and curly permed hair and I had a leather jacket on. I, I was drunk and I was drinking barley wine, which is like a West Indian drink. So me and this other guy from Peckham, well-known face, I won't name his name, sister, we come in the turnstiles, but he got held up at the turnstiles about saying about a ticket. I've gone in, in the ground, gone into the North Bank, and to my right, there's 300 Arsenal, all their top boys. I look down on the pitch and I see my brother, my friend with the beard, um, all, all my halfway line crew, and Mr. Bannon was with them, and all Arsenal was laughing at them because they got, just by numbers, got run on the pitch. So I've gone crazy. I've gone... To my right, I've gone into the middle of the arsenal, put my hand in my coat. Now I've got nothing. I said, oh, Mill, who wants it? I said to him, all spitting at me, big, big bundle. And um, it held the match up for five or ten minutes. Crowd pushed down. Please got me your nicked. So what they've done, they took me round where the West Lower is. But what happened, when I got to the um, where the floodlight was at the, the corner of the, of the um, clock end, people just got over the wall 
punched the two coppers, got me and uh, pulled me into the crowd, got away. But that, what James Bannon said, he said I was in the seats fighting. I wasn't in the seats, I was in the North Bank fighting. I was, but I went to two, I went to two of his things in the West End, you know, when he was giving, and I took a picture of me when I was 19 in Spain on holiday with the main man and two, two of the four guys are dead now. And I showed it to him. Oh, he said, oh, that's the bloke who pulled, pulled the knife out and said, oh, don't worry, son. That was the captain. Who's, who's, who was it? who's been the toughest then, Mo Wool? Um, the captain. He's not the toughest of fighting. Mm -hmm. um, the guy, there's a guy who runs Milton Keynes. I won't say his name. Runs Milton Keynes from 86. He's an absolute maniac. They call him Angel Eyes because he's paranoid. Um, the guy who had trouble with his Range Rover this morning, um, the guy that was going to come with me and Danny, I put him number one. A man who's been fighting from a young age, me, one of the half. But he's he's a top man, top martial artist, been all around the world, and a, and and um, a heavy man. But he's. I show respect to my older ones. I put him. I put him in the top of the tree. The top man. Did you ever come across Big Baz as Zulu? God rest his soul, man. Like, yeah, yeah, great exactly, man, like, yeah. Like, like, like world champion kickboxer. What, you, what do you think, Bob? When you, you if you're turning a corner and you yeah, see yeah, someone, James, but it's fighting and fighting. Yeah, you can fight as you know. You look if you're in if you're in guard, you fight to win. Yeah, of course. If, if you if you have a shooter, a knife. I'm not putting Baz down, no due respect, but we had a big row with Birmingham in 93. We was 100-handed. They was about three, 400, and they had petrol bombs. And this was at London Bridge, and we chased them down the tracks. Lots of fighting, lots of, lots of ag. And that was all their firm, the, um, the, the Zulus. And um, we can have a meeting with them in, in two months' time. They're coming down. Well, they're saying they're coming down big, but there we go. But... Um, they got the worst of it. They got the worst of it then. But um, bringing me on, because I've got so many stories, you can, I, I go back to Birmingham. Um, the 30th of December, 1986, we're in Birmingham, night game. 400 firm on the train. The police tapped them all up. 22 of us slipped the police. So we run down the bank Birmingham have been waiting in the pub for us for since 12 o'clock, 350 handed. Come out. They see how many were sourced. They run initially. They come back. There's only 22 of us. They come out. Some of them had blades. Four mil guys got cut and they, they stole their leather jackets. We got pushed, run back to the station. Um, eight, um, 18 of us. I went over to two of their top boys, two, two black guys. It weren't Baz, but it's two of them. And I went up and um, had a bit of a rut with them, fight with them. And I had to keep my eyes because of the police. Bang, bang, bang. Put them down on the floor. Bang their heads on the floor. Uh, you're big, uh, you know the brummy actor, you big cunt. Come around the corner. I said, listen, mate, you can't do... I'm one man, you can't... Two of you can't do me. Went back to the rest of the mill wall. Uh, and I said, right, we're going to get black cabs to the ground. Take us to the away end. The taxi drivers thought it's humorous. They took us to the home end and set us up. We got there, eighteen handed, and there was six. There weren't three hundred fifty, but there were sixty of their firm there outside the bingo hall. The police run away for reinforcements to get the horses in there. So I said, nobody run. One guy went to run. Older guy, I won't say his name, is, uh, and I'll, I'll give him a smack in the mouth and ripped his shirt. So I had two young, we had a formation of three, six, like, like a Roman formation. They come steaming in and we just stood and we done them. And then the police put, put us into the ground. That was that, that was that night game. Did you ever go away with England? Once or twice. Um, I went to an England-Scotland match, friendly, when I had to leave the ground at half time. Why? Because three big Scots guys, a lot bigger, two, two brothers and a son sitting next to me. And they put it on me and the police were looking. I thought I'm going to get nicked here. And um, that was when Rooney was playing. And um, I said, right, come down to the toilets and I'll fight three of you. 
But I had second thoughts about it, and I thought, oh, I'm going to get nicked here. It's t t too many. So I just left. I just left the stadium. No, I'm not mm -hmm. going to. But um, in 19, when would it be? 1981. Because from Jan January um, 80 to the end of October 85, I was on a mail train, post office, Newcastle and back, Edinburgh and back. So there were 25 Millwall at Euston on the train and someone owed me some money. I've got on in my post office uniform, get the money. What do you think they'd done? They held me on the train. The train went. I've got no ticket for the match. We're playing, at, playing Wales at Wrexham. So... We got off at Wolverhampton to have a drink and it was like Tottenham with us, Wolves, Villa, Manchester City, Everton. But our 25 was at, like, at the front, the focal point. Gone in the ground, we'd gone in Wales End. Now you had 2,000 Cardiff one side and 2,000 Swansea the other side. And we was in the middle and as we were running them back, then we turned around, the others were coming forward. It's back and forth, back and forth. But initially when I came in, what had happened, I got, I got caught. Um, there's a crash barrier and someone kicked me in the testicles and I said, I said, I said to some of my pals, hold me up, hold me up for a couple of minutes. So I said, because I'm vulnerable now, just let me get, get, get myself some breath. We lost 4-1, but I didn't see none of the match. It, it was full on the whole, the whole time. And I'm, I'm standing in, a, in postman's uniform. Do you think my wall will ever go to Premiership? There's a chance either this season or next season. But what, what, what I'm hoping in personally is the way things are going in the Premier, you've got Everton and West Ham, two of our friends, both in the bottom three. I'd like them to come down next season and then go up, we go up the next season. Of course, we, we've got an ever-improving squad. We've got a lot of foreign players now and we're six at the moment with the game in hand. So so you would rather... But my luck would, would be West Ham and Mo Everton Wall go down and we go. <laughs> Do you think if Mo Wall go to the Premier that it brings it starts everything up again because the football violence isn't is mm. what it was in the mm. 70s 80s 90s it's kind of old it's mm. no, most families at the grounds now yeah, it's all seated it's all, um, yeah. yeah do you do you think it could maybe bring everything back again the way it used to well, be with Mill well if play Mill over Stratford you can imagine what's going to happen it's only four stops on the um, on the tube um, but as you know James have you, have you studied the history of Mill Football Club yeah, bits and bobs, yeah. They're, uh, they're Scottish. They're Anglo-Scottish yeah, club. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Morton's Jam Factory uh, in Dundee mm -hmm. and Scottish Dockers in Glasgow came down to the Isle of Dogs and they wanted to form a football team. And that's why it, Millwall, the Lions, it's a lion rampant. And Millwall's original colours is dark blue, white, blue, it's the Scottish colours. Yeah. We've had a lot of Scottish managers as yeah, well. That's why he's a mad bastard, because you've got that <laughs> Scottish in you. Well, we are different from Chelsea. We're, we're close to Rangers, but anyone who comes into the inner circle, we've got Celtic guys from were born up there, and we've got Celtic guys from Corby and from East End of Glasgow, and we've got Rangers, Aberdeen, Hearts. We've got a mixture. Mm -hmm. We've got a mixture of them. Um, Did you ever go and have a tear up for any other firms? I've been over to Chelsea, guested for them a few times. I was over there in 2014 and um, they were playing Galatasaray. And my mate who's passed away now, one of their main guys, he passed away in 15. We come out of his house in Shepherd's Bush. He was walking down the Fulham Road and all the Turkish guys, we were going bang, bang, bang like that. We got to the ground. He said, Bob, I feel ill. I've got to go home. So I'm still there. So next thing, you've got 50 of their main boys outside the away turnstiles, Galatasaray. Now I'm not even the Chelsea sport. So I'm with this guy, stocky guy, and we've gone forward and whacked a couple of them, two of us, and we pushed them back, run them. And the other Chelsea was like, was behind us. And uh, what happened, there's, there's a police officer, he's one of these long-term guys, six foot six, sergeant, and the police ask these silly questions. You, you think they've got half a brain? Now, he come up to me, because he, he does Brentford, Fulham, Chelsea, QPR, West Sergeant. He said to me, what are you doing over here? Because he knows I'm Millwall. I said, you know the way it is, Governor. My wife is a Chelsea support. I've just come over to get a couple of programmes. So he said, go and fuck off, like. So he knows what, what's going 
got to go to Plum Broadway out, out the because I'm going to get my colour felt. Mm -hmm. But uh, silly question, what are you doing now? He knows what I'm doing over here. What do you think? You like the Turkish mob, the Polish kind of Italians, they're kind of all cycles as well. Like the yeah, we, we get a lot of um, people over in Millwall. We get a lot of Dutch, Germans, because we've got Dutch and Germans playing. A lot of Italians. If we have a massive game, and it's like Everton, West Ham. Why Everton? All Everton. We played them in 73, and um, a load of youngsters went in. The police put them in the Everton end. We knocked them out of the Cup 2-0. And they, they stabbed a load of 15 and 16 year olds. So they got knives from cutlery from the girls in the um, hot dogs and uh, selling teas and that. And they just boom, boom. And what happened? Millwall had a good firm, at least 2000. Manchester City was playing in Liverpool at, at Anfield. And we were so angry. We, we ran right and we chased all three of them. That was, I, was only, I, was only, I was only young then. I would have been, uh, I was uh, 14. Just before my 15th birthday. Does somebody not pull a gun out as well like, on a scrap? Um, or was it just all knives? Starting pistols. Why? Um, What's the point in that then? I thought I, it was all... We always thrown a hand grenade on the pitch at Brentford. As you do, aren't it? <laughs> well, in the major rounds, you're going to get, like, as I said at London Bridge in March 84, mm. they were tooled up to the gunnels. Anybody ever them. die, Bob? Yeah, well... Um, we killed a guy at Embankment. You know the Foot Soldier film? Yeah. You know when he turned around and said um, it was just our stragglers? It weren't. It was their main firm coming back from Chelsea. And there was like 300 mil war, but they, they, had about, they had about 800 or 1,000 on the train. But our people was all masked up and tooled up. One of their guys got stabbed in the chest and killed. But they killed they killed one of ours in seventy five when he when he um he got hit by a train. He was attacking West Ham fighting. He he, he got off the train the wrong side. The train come round and killed him. So it's um one one at the moment. So that's when it goes a bit extreme, isn't it? Especially if people just want to tear up. Like some of these guys in these firms are lawyers and see what what happened, uh, James. They, they used to be after me and Tiny and another guy, elder guy, who I won't say his name because he's more out the frame now because of his health issues. Tiny's passed away, cancer of the throat, and it's like me. I've put the word out, not that I'm flesh or anything. Look, look at me now. I've, I've I was nearly dead, but I'm, I'm, I'm back here for a reason. All the guys that said they, they're going to deal with me over West Ham – I've, I've told them, I'll meet you somewhere in the East End. I'll take two or three of you on at a time. They never took me up on the offer. But, um... Would you still be... It's not, it's not, it's not personal, James. It's mm -hmm. tribal. You know this. Yeah, of course, man. It's tribalism, man. It was people try to protect their own. But when did, did you ever... Re would you ever get out, Bob, even though you're in your 60s? Like, would you ever stop? You would stop because... The police have got the eyes on me all the time and a couple of our older boys, when we go to matches, they're looking at us. So any mistake we make, they're going to have us. Because they know all the stuff we got away with over the years. Do you think they would ever plant anything on you? Um, has that always been a concern or is that just a bit far-fetched? Not, not me and, and some of my close friends because we're not, we're not, we're not drug people. But... There's other people at Millwall who's been nicked recently who are, um, they haven't got them for the football, but they've um, raided their house for um, for drug dealing. So if they can't get them one way to get, but I'm, I'm, I've never been a drug man. What about Sunderland? Because I've, I've heard a few boys saying that they were right up for that back in the day. Well, we got them in um, on the 4th of February. They're bringing a massive firm down. So that, that'd that be very interesting. They're bringing two or 3,000. So that... That's going to be uh, quite interesting. Yeah. Are you still going to all the games, Bob? Not all of them. Um, I'll be at the Sunderland game. Mm -hmm. Who, what, what was your favourite ground to go to? Favourite ground to go to? Well, obviously West Ham, wasn't it? And mm -hmm. Someone sent me something on social media, all West Ham was singing, because you know they lost at Wolves. They're all singing, because like, there's a lot of supporters think they're going to go down. And they was all thinking, uh, we, uh, we're going to Millwall and that, singing about Millwall, but they go down. 
because even though we're in the playoffs now, I don't think we go up this year. We I might be wrong, but they're all getting excited because of uh, a chance of playing us again. We haven't played them for like uh, 2012. Which our greatest memory being at a Mulmo watch? Um, or the greatest memory is a rather obscure one. You're going back to. Um, the 80s, um, it would be 1983, we was in the second division and we was gonna, on the where George Graham was manager and we was going down to the bottom and we needed to win the last game. Now, we played at, Chester, at Chesterfield and the gate was like 4,500, but 3,500 were Millwall. And we won the game 1-0 and stayed up by the skin of our teeth, a penalty. And... The atmosphere, and what, as the trains come in, 500 on each train, it was 3,500 at Chesterfield Station. And when they all started singing and that, it was like tears would come out of your eyes, very emotional. But that was a long, long time ago. But it's just a, it's just the passion, the passion of Millwall. What about now? Like obviously, if you're getting a bit older and it's not even a football match on and you've seen old enemies, like, what happens? Nothing. Everyone reacts differently. Um, I wouldn't do anything. Personally, a lot of my friends are different. Obviously, um, I would leave it, but if they, as we say, if they put it on me and they wanted it, mm-hmm. you'd, have to, you'd have to go, you go for it. You got any regrets, Bob? Hey, Bob. I've got, I've got regrets that I haven't. I'm, I'm not sitting here as a multi-millionaire because I've, I've had millions go through my hands, but I've, um, I've given a lot away and um, I've lent money. And when I lost my dad at 21, and he was only 50, 56 at cancer, he said, "You're your own worst enemy, son. You shoot yourself in the foot." So I'm very honest. And um, when I times in my life when I've had money I've had a big entourage following me and the fall of his money has soon parted and I've never kept anything um I'm a person you can ask me any personal question and I'll tell you I don't don't hold I'm not sneaky I don't hold anything back you're just kind of loving for the moment yeah I'm just well I've got a second chance of life because um when a doctor tells you you I've only seen one person worse than you yeah what happened with your health there just recently well, on the 10th of November, I've got seven grandchildren, four girls and three boys. I was picking up from school my 10-year-old and I felt sort of queasy and then I collapsed in the school playground and it was like um, diabetes plus like a mild stroke. But I also picked up sciatica in the right leg and back and what happened, the caretaker, who's a West Ham supporter from Barking... <laughs> Him and all the teachers picked me up, put me into like, outside the reception on the chair and started giving me sweet stuff. My son-in-law come, picked me up, took me to the hospital and then they'd done tests on it. When, when, they, when they see that my, um, not my sugar leg, and my, and my ketones, it should be low or O1, it was 5.4. Straight away, all drips on me for three days. I was in the hospital for eight days. But when the doctor comes around, he says, I've only seen one person worse than you. I think myself, well, perhaps it's not my time to go, James. No, nah, it's clearly not, because you were still, you're still, still to come still on sit- here. I'm, sti- like- I'm still sitting here with my, my ugly face. <laughs> <laughs> but um, How is that, Bob, when you're, you're kind of that fucking heaven's door, man, where it makes you reevaluate your life? Like, does it, you just going to keep doing what you're doing, or does it make you question everything, especially with grandkids? And Yeah, well, I, I do a little bit of door work but I'll, I'm in the future, but I'm only going to do selective places. Because it's a very dangerous game. Very dangerous game, James. Yeah, especially now, man. It's See, in 99, you're going to like this. In 99, there's a rave in Lewisham. Three different security teams. There's one of my West Indian friends' security teams. And one of, one of your very good friends, Mr. DC... No, I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's got his. So I'm there. Good money, three hundred and fifty pound. 
Now, this is a rave. There's a lot of punk people coming to them. Now, I'm standing now, and DC come in with his crew, with a bob and box. Now, he's a year younger than me. He knocked me on the shoulder. All right, big fella. You know the way. He gave me a knuckle duster and a kosh. I thought, he doesn't know. It's a funny way to approach. And I said to my mate, I said, I'm not working. This three, I'm not working with that fucking idiot. He's bringing on too much heat. Now, what's happened? We're all, if we're told out and we start bashing people, there's a strong likelihood they're going to come back with shooters and some of us are going to get clipped. I, I went home, didn't I? I, I? I give away 350 quid because of the way DC approached me. But there you go. What can you... Leopards don't change their spots, do they? But, uh, what do you think looking back in your life? Uh, it's, been, it's been an interesting life. This is... Um, what I've told you is just a minute... A minute part of it. Mm -hmm. Just a minute part of it. I'll, I'll give you a lot of the early stuff, not so much of the, the late stuff, but... What was Danny Dyer like when you'd done the, the documentary side of things? I liked him. He wouldn't come in the pub. Why? He, he thought he was going to kidnap him <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the Golden Lion pub. Mm -hmm. I had one of my ex-SAS soldier mates sitting in there. And that. We was, and um, he interviewed me, and then, um, then one of the producers, he... There was. Uh, I went back a second week, and they done. They done more interviews. You haven't. You haven't seen the the cut off bit. You've only seen that. So you've only seen the bit. Um, you've seen you've seen the bit which with Danny Dyer, but there's another bit that I done where I was standing outside New Cross Station talking about that business with the, they come with three when I got arrested and de-arrested. Mm -hmm. But um, yes. A lot of my life, I'd change, yeah. I made, I made a lot of mistakes, James. Made Does that, mistakes. see, like, the fellow on the football factory and the, the Danny Dyer, uh, foot, the, like the football casual scene, like, mm. did you think that enhanced the violence even more because it became yeah. cool? For a while, yeah. Well, Danny Dyer was playing Chelsea, but he's West Ham. The, the other guy, the stocky guy, um, he's Millwall, and Tamar Hussain's Millwall. Yeah, big time I used to be... Involved in the scenes back yeah, in the day, he, he's, not? he's from New Cross. Got so much time for Big Tamer, man. Great guy, yeah. but he's a big fucking unit in himself as well. Yeah. But yeah. like, do you think um, it will ever be as ruthless as it was back in the seventies and eighties? Um, because there's too no, much cameras in that now. Do you think it's fell out of its ass? See what happens through the social media and the firms. We're playing Birmingham in a couple of months. They, they've already called it on, which means they put the initial information out. But when you put information out on social media, the police, within Scotland Yard, they got a big department that deals with football. Right? They know all the top boys, where they drink, who they are. They got photographs up. When they go to uh, Hendon Police College, all the photographs up on the wall, but so and so, blah, blah, blah. I've been to games when the coppers, young coppers come up to you, hello, Bob, how are you? They're their best friend. Now, how do they know me? It's part of the induction. Now, what Birmingham have done, they told Millwall, now some people are up for it, some are not. Um, the problem we've got, they want us to come to Covent Garden, meet them in Covent Garden in the afternoon for a big off, but there's too many cameras there. Uh, you're asking for trouble. Because everybody like even even in my physical condition, we all like a rass, the trend, and we all like it. But um, to go to Covent Garden, you're just asking for trouble. What about the people who watch and saying, "Oh, you shouldn't be fighting at football and the moaning about it"? Like, what do you say to them? <laughs> I can understand, but we're like heroin addicts, and there's guys in their seventies still fighting Melbourne now, who, who are half dead. Blokes in their seventies. Right, and make, make me look young at, at nearly 65. Now, you can't control yourself. You can't control yourself. I, I could be standing outside the Millwall Cafe and someone comes up to me, Sunderland's top boy or, or um, Birmingham's top, and, and not, as we say, offer you out. Even though I might get a battery and I'll beat to death, I'm still going for it because I, I can't back down in front of my, my people because... Because I'm known as, you know, I have to go for it. It's part, it's like being in the mafia. There's never a cut off point. Yeah. 
you just die more well, Bob. Mm. Just but I should, I should have, I should have kept more money in my pockets, James. That's the trouble. The I've, give, I've given loads of money away to people yeah. I shouldn't have done, and then and then they've um, well, there was a pub um, called the Fox Small Pub, and two of our top people used to run it. And what happened? One of the younger firms in in eighty nine, they turned around and said, right. They said to the older ones, we're taking over, you're past it and that. So one of the older ones who's, who's dead now, he died of a drugs overdose, um, little guy, born in Ireland, he's like a totter. He pulled a gun out and put it to this guy's head, uh, this younger mill guy's head, and said, who's taking over? This was in the pub. I was in the pub with my brother and because I've been married to two black girls, it's, it's not racist people. No one would say, but a guy got out of his tree. I bought a round of 14 people in the round, in the pub, 89. He's sitting on the stall. And he, I just give him his drink and he turned me down and said to me, um, call me nigger lover. So I ate him on the chin. He went up in the air, down on the floor. I didn't run a neck. And I said to the two guys that's running the pub, like our people in the circle, F group boys, I said, sorry, blah, blah, I see what happened and that. And then, then I just left the pub. But Af African stupid, you know what I mean? But um, it's some, somebody made a film or wrote a book which, which, which would cover my life. I think DC done it. He, um, um, I'm on the, he said, I'm on the fairground and uh, I've got to get off or something. Have you heard that? Yeah. But that, that's... It's been every time I, I thought I was going to slow down, some other incident would happen, not just at football, but it's to do with villainy and everything as well. Mm -hmm. um, I had a guy, he's passed away now, lived in Bermondsey. He, he phoned me up, and um, his father's a very famous guy, villain from East London, and he was with, um, he was with the R firm, and um, he. He got, he got in the blind beggar. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, right through the nuts. Yeah. His son, who'd been a drug addict, he's passed away now for 20 years, come back on the scene in 2004 and he started giving it large to me. He phoned me up one day in 2012. Now his problem, I knew where he lived. He didn't know where I lived. He's on the phone and he must have been off his rocker because... I couldn't get a word in edgeways, and he turned around and said to me, um, he's going to kill me, yeah? Put the phone down. So I've gone, I got in my car, drove down to his house, 7.15 on a Monday night, knocked at the door. I got a massive butcher's knife on me, and I thought, I'm, not I'm going to do, do him in. Opened the door. Hello, Bob, nice to see you. Come in, we've known each other since we were 12. Have a cup of tea. So he's sitting, sitting there for a drink of tea and then and then um, he had a couple of people he was obviously serving up, but he had some, some customers coming, so then I went. He had the opportunity to take me out. He threatened to do it. I've gone down there, told up, and, and the guys just... But... Um, What's your worst? A lot of jealousy. Uh, what, what it is, is people at Millwall... Because I... Um, because I took the mantle from a young age, there's a lot of people at Millwall jealous of me. A lot of people are going to do this and do that to me. And, this, and I put a lot of people in their place and they don't like it. So I've probably got more enemies at Millwall than I have with the other teams like West Ham, believe it or not. But it's still only a small percentage, but a significant suspense. But... Doing this now, there's going to be people. We, we call them the this people over there, like we call them me, Danny, and we call them the Jealous Brothers. It's people so far. Like, if I do this or brought a book out and done a few more interviews on, on the, the social media circuit, they'd be like, oh, 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 and all that nonsense. Mm -hmm. But because of my medical condition and I nearly stuffed it, I thought to myself, I've got to go, I've got to, um, because it's a long time since I've done any of this stuff. Uh, what, was but, what was Tiny like? Six foot three, boxer, brought up in Peckham with me. Um, I'm two and three quarter years younger than him, known him from a young age. Uh, he's, met, he's met all my uh, kids, mixed race kids and that. And uh, when I went to the captain's funeral in 2010, 
he was one of the six who carried his coffin. And my boy went, my boy's a bank manager. And um, when, it, when he first got the area manager job working for um, Lloyd's and Halifax, I asked him a question. You don't get it if you don't ask. I know, I know what the answer was, but I still, I'll say, can you put, um, can you put a load of bags out the back uh, with fifty pound notes in, and I'll come in a little van to take the. He's a straight goer though, mm -hmm. no one. But Tiny said to him, "Oh, he's a big fella." Like, but Tiny's, um, he was well loved. There was between six hundred and a thousand at his funeral. Um, they said, "Mr. Garwood, um, you got to stop smoking. You got cancer of the throat, or he's getting cancer of the throat. You're smoking sixty fags a day." And his answer was that to smoke a th smoke hundred. Just sort of he didn't like to be told, but um, in his latter years, he used to um, he used to uh, he went in a club in the Old Kent Road called the Ninety Nine, and um, one of our older fellas was in there with my brother, and um, he says, "I can't stay long. I've got a bit of work to do." You, you know what that is, don't you? And he had his coat, and he had a Glock under a Glock under his coat. He used to um, do hits for um, up and down the country. Yeah, it seemed it because when I had yeah. Bill on, I think there was a phone call between the two of them just because they were old enemies. Like, mm. Would you ever have that if you were on your deathbed and a West Ham man wanted to phone you to try and uh. have a chat with you? What would you yeah. do? Uncle Bill, yeah. What would you do? If, what, <laughs> from old church. Yeah, what would you do if you were lying in your deathbed and, yeah. and somebody from West Ham wanted to speak to you? What would you say? Well, the second world would be off, wouldn't it? <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, Tiny's a, a, a character, a character, but very much a character. But um, yes, it, the two blokes we miss more, most is him and the captain, the guy with the beard. He went in 12, December 12, and the other one went in um, March uh, 2010. Uh, Tiny was only 57 and, and Dave was um, 65. Does that make you sad when you see the old school ones kind of passing so young? Yeah, yeah. But um, there's certain parameters you have to... Like when I'm, I'm sitting opposite you, I will not mention any names of people who are still... Alive. Why alive. is that? It's Respect. just... The, when they're dead, they're dead. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm not a grass and I, I work to the old... I've never had anyone over for big money and I've never grassed anyone up to the old bill. So... Leopards don't change their spots, and you know I'm not going to change in at, at 65. Am I? I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. So we work, and a lot of people will be, will be looking at. They'll be shocked that I've started doing interviews again. So um, yeah, but good on you. Like you say, you're 65. Mm -hmm. and you, there's a chance you might you wouldn't have been here just a, a, a while back. When a doctor I mean? says there's only seen one person worse than you when you initially came into the hospital with your condition. Yeah, but you've clearly got the fight in you, Bob. Do you know what I mean? That, but. As I said to my mate who, who dropped me at the station before I met Danny, the, the big man, mm -hmm. anybody, and I swear on my father's grave in front, if anybody, whether it be in my circle, my team, or any, if anybody wants, I've lived a good, if anyone wants to try and take me out or wants to meet me anywhere for, for some noise, come and meet me. Silly old me, ugly me. If, if, you know, you understand what I mean, James? Where do you go forward for the future, Bob? Well, um, got I've got a house in Blackpool, which the missus is, uh, missus is up there at the moment. Um, my oldest daughter lives there with her two kids. My oldest grandson's at Leicester University studying law. But, um, yeah, we got a house up there. Got that in November, um, November 2014. But um, I've got a rented flat down, down in London. I will go up there from time to time, but I will never totally leave London. I never totally leave London. So, um, that's just because you're born in Britain. Well, well I've got my son down here, my youngest daughter down here. My youngest daughter's got four children. She's only uh, 32, 33 in March. But um, my son's got one, the bank man, he's 39. He's trying for one. He's going to try for one next year, another one. And my big daughter's got two up in Blackpool. But, um, Would you ever want your sons following in your footsteps, the mole wall scene? Um, I used to take my boy to the old ground, but he's not, because he's mixed race, and all the black boys that used to mix, mix with in Peckham, 
it's like um, they think we were still members of the Ku Klux Klan. But we, a lot of our, some of our top boys have been black guys and we still got a couple. Tiny's dead, but there's, there's another couple. Mm -hmm. and one, and one, one's done a lot of prison, a lot of villainy. Uh, like Tiny, he came here when he was eight years old. He's now 67. He knows how to make money. Now he, he, he's a preacher. Got a lovely new Mercedes. He, he, he preaches in front of two or three hundred like African and Jamaican Caribbean people, the happy clappers. And he's got the gift of the gab. Mm. And um, we see him from time to time, but not, not, not that often. But uh, What's your worst memory as a, a Mulwall fan? Worst memory was um, May 72 when we thought we got promoted to the first division when we were told falsely that Birmingham had lost to Sheffield Wednesday and they'd beaten them. And we, Orient needed to beat Birmingham in the last game of the season. Um, and there was 13,000 Millwall Orient, 10,000 Birmingham and 10,000 Orient, 33,000 crowd. Um, half time, there was a bomb scare. Birmingham won one nil, so uh, we never went up. That, I, I was bro broken hearted. I was 14, I was crying my eyes out, but... Um, is that the closest you have been to no, being in the top in, division? No, we've been in the top. We, yeah. we went with the two Scottish managers, um, uh, John Doherty and Frank McClintock. What year was that? Uh, May 1988. We was in the top division for two years, from 88 to 90. It's a long time you have not been there, but on it, yeah. nearly 40 years. But, uh, yeah. But... Uh, we're trying, we're trying, James. Yeah. Uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to try and get a book out or something now? Are you just going to cut? Well, I hope the feedback I get from this, I hope it's good. And I'm willing to do more interviews, a book. And if I can get it organized, because there's a few people um, suggested, maybe a film. Um, not to put him down, but if Jason Mariner can get, get three million up front. And he's got the gift to the gab, but he's got he's like Joe Pasquale, he's got a squeaky voice. <laughs> but I've done ten times more than him. Not not being flash. I've done ten times more than him. Just want to shout out Danny for setting up the interview as well. Um yeah. would you like to finish up on anything, Bob? Yeah, it's a pleasure to have met you, James. Likewise. And uh, and maybe we're bumping into each other in uh, in the future. Yeah, definitely, Bob. Listen, <laughs> God bless you. God bless you. Take care and the whole you live the rest of your life, mate, just doing what you want to do. All right, brother. Take care, brother. God bless, man.